It's so good to worship together. It really is good to worship together. Um, Becca and I were in Traverse City all week. We were at a pastor's conference. Got, got to reconnect with several um, friends of ours and just be refreshed and, and be on the road, do some more miles on the road together. Uh, it was awesome. But I've been thinking all week about this message. And we're in this series called Top Ten. And we're going through the Ten Commandments, not as like some sort of checklist that if we could somehow check off every box, we'd somehow be right with God. That's not really how it works. But we're looking at them to see, is there an invitation for us to draw closer to Jesus as we look at these things? And we're seeing that there is an invitation for us to be more like Jesus, to walk closer to Jesus. And so we've made it all the way to number nine. And if you don't know what number nine is, it's found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. And it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So you kind of get this picture right out of the gate of somebody who's sitting in court and, and, you know, they've been put on the witness stand because they've witnessed something and they're trying to tell what happened. And the, the instruction here is, don't, when you get on the witness stand against somebody, make sure you're telling the truth, right? How many of you guys have ever been to court before? Just go ahead and you're in church. Let's just go ahead and have some fun. How many of you guys have ever been in court before? Okay. I, we, years ago, we were at my dad's church. My dad, he ministers to a lot of people who are in jail and come out of jail and stuff like that. And so we were in his church and, and he asked one time something like, how many of you guys have ever been to jail? And like every hand went up except for my wife and I. We're like, we're the minorities here for sure, you know? And, uh, but I have been to court. One time I went to court and it was because my dog, like somebody came into my yard, like an energy worker or something was trying to come into my yard. The dog put its paws up on the fence and was barking because the stranger was trying to get in our yard. And so the worker came and ended up forcing the dog out of the way and the dog bit him in the process. So somehow, uh, this was our fault. I don't know how it was our fault, but somehow this was our fault. And so these animal control people, these ladies, these animal control ladies had to come to our house. Now at the time, uh, we had four young kids and Becca was pregnant with our fifth. And so they're standing, we had this big picture glass window. And as the animal control people are coming to take our dog away, our kids are in front of that window, just tears, just crying as they're taking away. Becca's standing there, she's pregnant, she's crying, everybody's crying. They take this dog away to dog jail, and we went, no, seriously, so we took, I took all the kids, and we went and visited this dog in dog jail multiple times. He had to stay for 10 days, had a 10-day sentence, I guess, to see if he had rabies, and so we would go in there, and the kids, I mean, taking all the kids, and these animal control people would see what's going on, and so for some reason, I had to go to court to, to settle this. I can't even remember why, but so I show up at court, and there's all these things happening, all these people, and there's a judge, and all this stuff. I'd never been. I didn't know what to do, and so... It's getting close to my time to show up. And I noticed that those animal control ladies are like right there in, in the building. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I kind of, you know, saw them, acknowledged them. And all of a sudden the prosecutor came over to me and he said, your, court, your case has been dropped. And I was like, really, what? He's like, yeah, those ladies over there talked to the judge and got a drop. I'm like, yes, an advocate before the judge, just like Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, so, because they saw, I think they saw all the tears and all that stuff happening. That's that's about the only time that I can remember being in court. I guess it's good that I don't remember anything else. Um, but what 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 God is trying to do here is He's trying to not just set up moral things in these laws. He's actually setting up legal, you know, for a way for a society to interact with one another. Because He called this nation out to Himself, but He's also creating these. Like when you set up, when you have a, a problem with one another, make sure that you don't bear false witness against one another. And so he's setting this up. And in ancient societies, when they would like stone somebody to death for a crime, they would have the witness of the crime who testified against them be the one to cast the first stone. And you guys know you better have said it right, right? You better have the right story because that's a lot of weight on you. But it wasn't just the legal system he was setting up. We can find out just by reading maybe even just a different translation here in the Amplified that he was setting up more on how to live in relationship with one another, not just the legal society. So let's look at this in the Amplified version, Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. It says, you shall not testify falsely, that is lie, withhold, or manipulate the truth. I like how that says it's lie, withhold, because sometimes we think, oh, I'm not telling a lie, but it's withholding or manipulating the truth against your neighbor. And then it says any person. 
person. Why any person? Because Jesus says everybody's your neighbor, right? So we don't get to pick and choose who we apply that to. Now, some research that I read a while ago said that we have trouble as a society distinguishing lies from the truth. In fact, our accuracy of detecting truth over lies is like 53% or like a coin toss, basically. And they did a study on Facebook, which is a great place to do a study, right? But they did a study on Facebook to see among 1,500 people how fast a lie would travel and how fast the truth would travel. And they discovered that it was sometime, something like that a lie traveled six times faster than the truth on social media. And if this is true, now I don't, how do you guys know, you don't even know what to believe anymore, right? But if this is true, because it's hard for us to detect these days, but if it's true that a lie travels six times faster than the truth, how many of you guys know that Satan might want to try to use that against us? Because a lie doesn't have to be true to affect you as if it were. Because if you just believe the lie as if it were true, it affects you as if it were true. And so you gotta, you got to believe that Satan is going to be leveraging those lies against us. He's going to be planting lies. In fact, Scripture calls him the father of lies. Many times in Scripture when you see the, you know, it talks about gossips or malicious gossips. That word literally means slanderer or literally means devil or diabolos. It, it's, it's, that's, that's what it, it, it literally, so, so what is it saying? It's saying whenever we gossip, slander, or lie about people, what we're doing is we're doing Satan's work for him. So he doesn't even have to do it if he can get us to do it for him. That's why this is so important for us to look at. And, and, and what I've seen a lot of times is, you know, in this area of bearing false witness with one another, some of us just do not know how to live in relationship with one another. And so some of us, since we're not mature enough to know how to handle relationships with one another, what I've seen people do as a pastor and, you know, towards a church or towards just relationships with one another, here's what I've seen people do. They don't know how to interact with one another, and they don't have a real reason to break fellowship with people. And so what they do is they invent something. So we, we make up something in our minds and in our hearts that's a bigger deal than what it actually is to justify why we would break fellowship with that person. Man, it's really quiet in here all of a sudden. Man, this must be preaching good or something. I don't know. I've seen this happen. And that's a form of bearing false witness. And so it's very, very serious. Now, I want to look at a story that really changed my life. And I've told this story before. It's, a, it's out of the Bible, but you, you, many of you guys know this story. But um, the way that it, I read about this really just impacted me. And it's a story about a guy named Saul. And many of you guys know King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. He was anointed king because, uh, you know, God wanted uh, the people to come to him. But they said, no, we want a king like all the other nations. And so God said, all right, I'll give you a king. They gave him King Saul. He was a good guy. And then all of a sudden he started to stray a little bit because, you know, something went off the rails. And God says, I need to anoint somebody else as king. He goes to the house of Jesse, he goes through all of his sons, and you guys, many of you guys know the story. He went through the oldest and went all the way down. He's like, do you have any more kids? And he's like, well, I got this one kid. He's the youngest. He's out in the field. He's keeping, you know, watch over the sheep. And he, we didn't even think to bring him. So they called him in, and it's David, and they, then Samuel anoints David as the next king. He's been anointed as king, but he's not king. He's just a young man. He's just a teenager. And so he's anointed king, but he's not king. But something happens to David once he becomes anointed king. He begins to, even though he's anointed king but not king, he begins to have kingly attributes even though he's not wearing the crown. And so even as a young person, and he went through, he slays a giant, did all this stuff. Pretty soon, everybody's talking about David instead of Saul. And, and in fact, it says, you know, the ladies are singing about David. I mean, you know, Saul, he's killed his thousands, but David, he's killed his tens of thousands. And they begin, the ladies start singing about David. King Saul gets jealous. He starts to hunt David. He doesn't want David, he, he doesn't want David to steal the throne from him. And so he starts to hunt him out, to kill him. And, and so David has a choice to make. He's been anointed king, but he has a choice to make. Does he fight back? Does he try to take the crown? Or what does he do? And he has an opportunity one time in a cave when Saul is hunting him down. And Saul goes into the cave. And David could have killed Saul right then and taken the throne. But he just cuts off a little piece of his garment just to prove that he was there. And he, he says, I'm not going to touch the Lord God's anointed. You say, well, how is he anointed? He seems like a horrible person. He's hunting David. He's, 
And David had, he was acting in such a nature as a king that he would not touch who God had put in place, even though that person was acting horribly. How many of you guys have ever had somebody like that in your life, right? They're like, they're overseeing things. They're in charge. They're not acting right. What do you do in that situation? David decided that he was going to remain faithful to who God uh, said that he was going to be. And he did not touch the Lord's anointed. Well, years pass and King Saul was, you know, he, he died and David does take the throne. He's now in charge. He's done a lot of stuff now. He has some sons, and one of his sons was a guy named Absalom. And Absalom, he, he, was, he had done some things that got him banished out of the kingdom ultimately, but Joab, one of David's right-hand guys, talks him into bringing him back. He says, this is your son. So he's like, okay, I'll bring him back in. And David is so filled with grace. I mean, if you read the story, he's so filled with grace over and over and over again to people who he, in the natural, should not be. And so he brings them back, but Absalom hasn't really seen the king for a couple years. They kind of kept their distance. It's okay to have some boundaries in life, right? And he kept his distance for a little bit, but he brought Absalom back. But then one day, something started to happen. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25, it says, Now Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all of Israel. Does this sound familiar? I mean, King Saul was king, and all of a sudden David was being praised. And now David's king, the tables have turned, and now somebody's, uh, everybody's praising somebody else. He's the most handsome man in all of Israel. He was flawless from head to foot. He cut his hair only once a year, and only then because it was so heavy, and when he weighed it out, it came to five pounds. I have no idea what that means, but evidently it was a big deal, okay? You got five pounds worth of hair, okay? You are the man. I don't know what that means, but uh, so now... Now the tables have turned. Instead of, I mean, it was King Saul as the king and David, you know, trying to keep his heart right. And the ladies are singing about David instead of Saul. But now David is king. And, and all of a sudden he's got somebody who's trying to challenge his throne. And the ladies are singing about this guy. And it's his own son. And there's a, there's a tension. And so then what happens is Absalom begins to be He begins to, I don't know if at first he's trying to usurp authority, but he's trying to identify where there might be problems. And in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 2, it says, He got up early every morning. This is Absalom. And he went out to the gate of the city. And when people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel they were from, and they would tell him from, they would tell him their tribe. And then Absalom would say, You got a really strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. So he would intercept people that were coming to the king and he would, he would say, you know, you got, you got a really strong case. I just don't think the king has time for you. And I don't think he was, I, I mean, it's hard to read into what's actually happening because the story moves pretty quick in scripture. But, but I just, I'm just guessing that at first he wasn't really seeing this as something that was wrong. He was trying to just do something right. He was trying to make sure that the people were taken care of because I think he did have a heart for people at at first. And so he'd say, you got a really strong case. And then he would say, well, I wish I were the judge. Like if maybe if somebody could appoint me judge, then I could take care of all these other cases that the king doesn't have time to hear. And so he began to listen to people's complaints and their issues and their their stuff. And then everyone could bring, he's like, then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment and I would give them justice. And then the people started to become attached to Absalom and they, they really began to realize, oh, this guy has a listening ear. The king may not have time for me, but this guy has a listening ear. And when the people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't let him. Instead, he took them by the hand and kissed him. And Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment. And so he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. I want you to see something here. Absalom wasn't necessarily even talking negative about the king. He was just identifying what the situation was and inserted himself as the solution. How many times in our life, you know, we don't really count it as bearing false witness against another person. We're not really necessarily talking negative about other people, but what we do is we try to build ourselves up in comparison to the other person. So the after effect or the indirect effect is that they are torn down. This is what Absalom is doing. He, he says something like, well, you know, the way he does it okay, I just might do it a little bit different than that, which is a lot better than what 
they would do it. And so he begins to subtly steal the hearts away of the people, and he slowly gathers a following against David, and, and he begins to, uh, to build a following and we do this in many different ways, even as believers. And, you know, how many of you guys have been in a room, you know, and somebody's offering prayer requests for somebody, but it's not really a prayer request. You know what I'm saying? It's like just telling Aaron everybody's dirty laundry. Like, you know, I, it, it, you know, there's a scripture about that where this Pharisee is saying, God, I'm so glad I'm not like that other person over there. I mean, they've got some problems, you know. And uh, so just to kind of lighten the mood, because it seems a little stressful in here right now. Um, just to lighten the mood, just kind of give us a picture. Maybe poke a little fun at ourselves. Maybe you've done this, maybe not this way, but let's have a little fun and see what is possible. Let's watch. Hey, Belle. Mm. Julie, Eunice, and I are so glad you could join our prayer group. Lord knows we need prayer now more than ever. Amen, sister. Barbara and I just love to lift the needs of others up in prayer. Well, I appreciate your invitation. Well, enough of this chitter chatter. We got to get this show on the road. Now, I don't know if you've heard, but the Hendersons are in real need of prayer. Tom Henderson lost his job. Did you see Tom Jr.'s haircut the other day? <laughs> he looked like a porcupine on Red Bull. I hear Tom Sr. spends all day on the computer looking at the internet, watching videos on the YouTube. That's probably why he got fired. Oh, no, no, no. His boss caught him on the surveillance camera playing Texas Hold'em. Hold him accountable, I say. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing for housewives like us to have hobbies, but he is a man of the church. He has a family. He should know better. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, I would like to lift up Verna Carlson. Oh, what? She has not been feeling very well. What? What's wrong with her? Well, I heard it was her weight, five pounds in one week. More like 15. Someone needs to tell her that eating ice cream will not save her demonic children. Oh, don't we know it. That little Jeffrey almost ruined the surface the other day, singing at the top of his lungs for all the world to hear. That's so wrong. Mm. I have a prayer request. Um, the Whitmans are going back to Peru for a month to build houses. Oh, they work so hard over there in that poor country. That's a good prayer request. They're such a nice couple. And her apple pie was the hit of the bake sale. Oh, yeah, but what about that V-neck sweater? I mean, if it had been any lower, well, I, I just didn't think that it was becoming. I noticed that, too. I didn't want to say anything. And let's not forget the dress that she wore last Easter. Um, I have another prayer request, um, for us, because, um, we're just sitting here gossiping, and I was thinking that, you know, we shouldn't be tearing down our brothers and sisters, we should be edifying them and lifting them up, so, we should probably pray for ourselves. Well, I guess you're right. We should know better. Yes, we should. No, I do it too. I mean, last week at the picnic, I told everybody that Betty's son was going to jail. And I found out he's going to Yale. <laughs> well, so. I don't know what happened to us. You know who's really bad at gossip? Who? I mean, none of us have been there before at all. I know that's just, that's, that's the, uh, that's Saturday night crowd that does that. Sorry, guys who are watching. Um, <laughs> so let's continue the story of David, though. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 13, it says, And a messenger came to David and said, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone with Af after Absalom. Then David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly, and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. And you see that David had two choices in this moment. He had two choices in this moment. He could... Uh, lose everything, lose his whole kingdom, or he could become a Saul to defend it. I want you to catch this because every one of us struggle with this in our lives. Because, because here's the thing, 
We all have these choices when we know that, that something is happening in our life like this. When we know, when we feel like the pressure or we feel like something's not right with other people in our life. We have two choices. See, God delivered David from Saul, not so that he could become a Saul, but so that he could remain David when he was faced with the same situation. See, God wanted David to be David on both sides. He wanted him to be David when he was hunted, and he wanted to be David when he was king, when someone else was trying to steal the throne. So David said, when he was being hunted by Saul, he's like, better he kill me than I practice his ways. But how many of you guys know, it always looks a little bit different when the tables are turned, right? It's sure easy to look at people and to look at King Saul and like, man, look how bad Saul is and he's trying to defend his kingdom. He's trying to take David out. But now if all of a sudden as David, from David's perspective, how many of you guys know it looks a whole lot different from David's perspective? I mean, now you can start to justify all the reasons why, well, this guy shouldn't be doing that. This guy shouldn't be talking that way. This guy shouldn't have stood at the gate. This guy shouldn't have done all these things. And isn't it that way in our life? It's easy for us to look at people who are doing wrong things. And then all of a sudden, when we're in the same situation, it's easy for us to list off all these reasons as to why we should be justified to do something that we once condemned. And so we have to keep a right heart on both sides. And so what I want to do is I want to talk to us, what do we do when we feel like maybe we're unfairly being talked about or being targeted or being our relationships are strained because I think if we can learn what we should do when it's happening to us then maybe it'll give us some compassion to not do that to other people so I want to give us four things I could list a whole bunch but I want to give us four things that I think are going to be helpful to us if you feel like maybe you're in a situation like that where you're under attack or maybe you you think maybe people are talking about me maybe I'm unfairly being accused of something maybe someone is there's tension in my relationships in some way shape or form here's the first thing number 1 let god be your defender this is one of the hardest things to do by the way to let god be your defender you know, I told you guys, we went to Glacier National Park and we went on these hikes and you guys saw the, you know, the, video, the video that we had with the bear. And as we were walking away from that encounter, we had another hour and a half or so to walk. And so we were walking back through all these, you know, th these bushes and all this type of stuff. We almost get back and all of a sudden we see this group of people. There's four or five people in this group on a hike coming in. It's dark, it's almost uh, nighttime and they're hiking in. And so I'm like trying to flag them down and warn them like, hey, I just saw something back there. You might wanna be careful. And, and uh, so they started asking me about this. Well, what was interesting is the guy in front had this huge camera strapped on him. Like it was a professional looking camera as they were going down this trail in the middle of Glacier National Park. And then there was a few people and then there was a person in back with another big camera. And so I began to talk to them. They began to ask me all these questions about, you know, bears and all this kind of stuff. And, and so I was showing them different videos and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like trying to tell them, I'm like, you're getting ready to walk into it, dude. And so it, I, I asked them questions. I was like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, well, we are uh, doing a YouTube documentary. Um, it's going to come out in about a year, but we're doing a YouTube documentary on government overreach. And I was like, really? And I was like, well, how do you feel about that? And I started talking to this guy and started to you know, tell him I was a pastor. And he looks over to the camera guy. And he's like, roll tape, roll it, roll it. And so he's interviewing me out there on this trail. And I'm talking about all this stuff. And anyway, he, he, gets, he gets done. He's like, yeah, it'll come back out in a year. And he's like, can I use that? And I was like, well, you know, make me look good. <laughs> and he said, oh, he kind of rolled his eyes. He's like, oh, I love it when people want me to selectively edit their story. And uh, he kind of rolled his eyes, and I, I was like, well, you know, I mean, you know, show me, like, killing a bear or something, you know, but um, that got me to thinking. You know that we all are an author to our own story? We're all, I mean, we're writing our story, whether you know, it's how we tell people what's happening in our life, it's how we live our life, it's how we live our online life. I mean, we're writing a script, we're writing a story. We're an author of a story. And in our own mind, do you realize that you have a story going on in your own mind, in your own heart? And here's the thing about that. If you ever thought about this, you are the main character in your story, pretty much. I mean, we want to say Jesus is, but a lot of times we're the main character. So everything in our story revolves around what's happening to the main character. And in this main character, in this story that we're all authors of, so we have all these stories going on, we are usually the good guy, right? I mean, most of us are the good guy as the main character in our own story that we're writing. I mean, when we read the Bible, we rarely read the Bible. And when we hear about the Pharisees or something like that, we never see ourselves as the Pharisee. We're always like, go get him, Jesus. 
you know, yeah. We're always like standing behind Jesus, like, yeah, go get him. Or we're never like Peter who blurted out something, you know, too soon. We're always like, I'd never, like, stupid Peter. Why did he do that, you know? But how many of you guys know, we'd probably have said something way before Peter did, you know? But we always write the story so that we're the good guy in the story. And we like to selectively edit our own story. There's a temptation for us, even without thinking about it, to naturally bend the story into our favor. And the reason I bring this up is because it's really hard if you want to follow after Jesus and follow after God's ways. There are so many times in life, in order to live right, there are going to be times in your life where someone only has half the story about a situation in your life. And there's a temptation for you to go and write that or fix that or fill in the blanks. And yet it might be completely inappropriate. You might be damaging other people when you do that. It's so frustrating when you can only tell, when you know somebody only has half the story and if you could just fill in the blanks for them, it would set everything straight. In fact, Proverbs 18, 17 in the Passion Translation puts it this way. So there are two sides to every story. The first one to speak sounds true until you hear the other side and then they set the record straight. How many of you guys have been like, yeah, I need to set the record straight in this situation? Here's the problem. You don't always get to tell your side of the story and keep a right heart. I know this as a pastor, but you know this just in living life. I, I, I've experienced this over and over and over again, where there's so many times when I'm like, they only have half the story. If I could just get up and just tell the rest of the story, then it would clear things up. And years ago, um, I left a, a church that I was on staff at because there were all kinds of crazy things happening. And so I, I didn't, I wanted to keep my, I wanted to honor and to keep my mouth closed. I, I could have damaged a lot of things, but I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, to, uh, to not hurt people on the way out because I, I could have done a lot of damage by, by sharing things that, that I was aware of. And so what happened is because I decided to not tell the full story to everybody and just, I'm just going to let God be my defender. What happened? Well, a bunch of people started making up reasons why I was leaving and pointing the finger and saying, oh, well, what did you do? What sin is in your life? And I'm like, there's no, no, I, I just didn't want to. And so what happens is you end up, you end up in, a, in, a, in a very tense situation where you want to defend when you want to set the record straight, but by doing so, you might damage relationships. It's a very tricky spot to be in. And there are times in your life when you do not get to tell your side of the story and still have a right heart. David, even while he was going through this, he was kind of banished, I guess, for a while. And some of the people from his kingdom were looking at him and cursing him, throwing stones and dust and dirt at him and cursing him. And some of his men were like, who is this person? How do they have the right to curse you? And David's response was, you know, it's possible that God led them to do that. I mean, you talk about unbelievable grace towards people. You talk about unbelievable grace towards people. To say, maybe I don't have the whole story. Now, I've shared this with you before, but this was another game changer for me. And I heard this story a while back about a Bible college professor who got up one day to teach these new Bible college students. And he said, 20% of what I'm going to teach you today is wrong. He said, the problem is I don't know which 20%. Because all of us think we have our theology perfect, right? I mean, so every single one of us right now, we think we know exactly what the Bible says, exactly what the book of Revelation means. Or at least we think we've got everything that we've got figured out and somebody else is wrong, you know? This guy was at least humble enough to say, I know, I think I have it right. But I know that probably 20% of what I'm going to say is wrong. I just don't know which 20%. And so I got to thinking about that in my life and relationships and situations how many of you guys have ever done this before where you replay a situation over and over again? You go through every conversation. You're like, I know what was wrong here, and here's what I said. And it, so I had replayed certain situations over and over again where I thought a wrong had happened to me. And I went back, and I was like, there's not even anything I would do different. There's not anything. Like, they were completely wrong. There's not. I've replayed it. I prayed. I went back to my Bible, and there's not anything I would do differently. And then I heard this, and I thought, maybe there's 20% that I just can't see. Maybe there's 20% that I was wrong, but I just don't know which 20% it was. And then it started 
to make me think about them. And I started to think, maybe they believe that they are 100% right. And they've went back and they've replayed it and they've went back and they've prayed and they've went to scripture and they think that there's 100% right that they would not go back and change anything, but maybe they've got a 20% and they just don't know where it is. See, that's where grace comes in relationships. We have to have grace in relationships to one another. So we have to be okay not always sharing our side of the story, which is so hard at times to let God be our defender. Because there are sometimes, you know, even as a pastor, that I just wish I could just get up and just say whatever I thought, you know? Like, you think I already do that, but I don't do that already, okay? I know it's amazing, right? You're like, really? No, there's a lot I'm holding back right now, okay? No, but there are times I feel, and I've showed this video before, but I, I'll just let you in on just to, because there are times all of us just want to say what's on our mind. It, it reminds me of this. Let's watch. Proverbs. If I may digress for a moment from my prepared message, I mean it when I say to you, you guys, sometimes you're bad. Don't be jerks. You're supposed to be good. I'm in my office every day and somebody comes in and they're like, hey, whoops. I'm like, don't. Dan, what is your deal? If anybody doesn't know, Dan is the worst. I took a vow to not say who was the worst, but it's Dan. You guys are making me look bad in front of God. What's that? Oh, look, it's Jesus. And he said, stop it. The word of the Lord. Anybody ever want to do that to people in your life before? <laughs> yeah, it happens to us too. So, all right. Number two. Live surprised, not paranoid. Something I learned a long time ago. It was a hard lesson. Because as a pastor, I say that I go on a lot of first dates and a lot of breakups. Okay, I go to, out to coffee with people and like, oh, hey, we love the church. We want to come join, join the church and have a lot of first dates. And then I have a lot of breakups. We go out to coffee and like, hey, um, yeah, no, doing something different, you know. And uh, so I started to honestly, okay, here's what happened. I started to get a hard heart. I started to assume that everyone had an issue before I knew about it. I started to assume that every time I was going to go out to coffee with somebody that it was going to be bad news. And so I started to fear something before the fear became a reality. And that was the way that I was trying to protect my heart. So I started to live paranoid that maybe everybody's got a problem. Maybe everybody's talking about me. Maybe everybody's got an issue. And then God one day was like, uh, Sean, you, you can't pastor that way watch me. You know, I was, I'm doing it, you know. No, he's, he's like, you can't pass it. Like, you have to have a thick skin and a soft heart. You have to live in the tension. Listen, in our relationships, you, you might as well figure out, we have to have thick skins and soft heart. You don't get to pick one or the other. If you have a soft heart, you won't last long if, if you don't have thick skin. Because there are going to be times when people do things to you that maybe they don't even know they're doing or even intend to do. And even if they do intend to, we've got to have enough grace to be able to love above the pain. And, and so, there's, so God said, you're going to have to have a thick skin and a soft heart. And so I made this decision that I was going to live surprised if somebody was, had an issue. I was going to live surprised. I wasn't going to live paranoid. I was going to live surprised. What does that mean? That, that doesn't mean that I don't use wisdom because I do use wisdom. That doesn't mean that I don't pay attention to the nudges of the Holy Spirit, because there are many times when Holy Spirit will come and say, hey, you need to deal with this issue over here even before I'm aware of it. Like, yeah, I'm very sensitive to those things. I take care of issues if I know about them. But here's what it means. Whenever I don't have all the facts and my mind starts to wonder about what ifs or what are they doing or what are they saying or what's happening over there, I refuse to live paranoid. 
and I'm gonna live surprised. I wanna be shocked if somebody has an issue. I'm gonna be shocked if somebody were talking bad. I'm gonna be shocked if somebody's lying about me. I'm gonna be shocked, I'm gonna be surprised. Let me be honest, I get surprised a lot, okay? I'm just telling you. But I refuse to live paranoid. There's no way to live. I am not gonna go there. Now, sometimes I have to pull myself back. I have to come back. I know I'm not perfect at this. I have to pull myself back and realize I'm drifting into that, to the what ifs, and my mind starts to wonder. I'm like, no, I am going to live surprised. What does that mean? That means I'm gonna do what scripture says and I'm gonna believe the best in people. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse seven, it says this, love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat for it never gives up. I'm gonna live surprised, not paranoid. That doesn't mean you don't use wisdom. That don't mean, doesn't mean you don't listen to the Holy Spirit. Of course we do those things. But think about your relationships right now. Are you living paranoid in relationships right now? And then let's ask a question, is that a godly way to live? To always assume the worst. Of course, it's the very opposite. I can't tell you how freeing it is to live surprised, not paranoid. It's a freeing place to be. All right, number three is this. Make it hard for people to doubt your character. Make it hard for somebody to, to, to manipulate a situation. What do I mean by that? That whenever somebody tries to do that, other people might say, mm, I don't know, I know that person. I know they make mistakes and they mess up from time to time, but I'm pretty sure their heart isn't that. And I wanna give them the benefit of the doubt because they've consistently told the truth. They've consistently tried to love. Yeah, they've messed up, but they come back and they consistently try to make things right. Make it hard for other people to doubt your character so that when someone tries to bear false witness about you, that there's a natural defense that rises up in everyone else around you because they think, I know that, that doesn't sound like them. There was a, I, I knew a guy several years ago who, uh, he went to go help this church and he, he was kind of the right-hand guy in the church and there was something going on where he disagreed with what was going on with the pastor and, and I was talking to the, on the phone with him and I was like, well, so what did you do? And he said, well, what I did is I went around and I met with everybody in the church and got them on my side about the issue. If you don't know, that's the wrong thing to do. If you just didn't know that, like there's a totally different way to do that. But if that were to happen to me as a pastor, I would hope that there would be many people that would say, ah, I know Sean's made mistakes in the past and maybe he's messed up here and there, but that does not sound like his character. And I hope that in your life that there would be people like that in your life. If, if, if there was some situation like that, that people would say, ah, I, they always go back to try to make, the, they always try to tell the truth. Matthew chapter five, verse 37 says, let, whatever, let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. In other words, just be a person of your word consistently. Make things right consistently. Make it hard for people to doubt your character. Make it hard for people because you are constantly going after the godly way. There's a reason why people follow David because he had a reputation of being a man of grace, a reputation of being a man that would uh, do what he said. Ephesians chapter four, verse 23, it says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each, of, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. Be a person who speaks the truth, who calls people higher. You, and to do this, you have to speak the truth, feed the truth, practice the truth more often than you think you need to. You have to speak well of people more often than you think you need to. You have to be people's champion more often than you think you need to. Because what you're doing is you're building a culture in your life. You're building a culture in your life. All right, the last point is this. This may be the hardest of all of them. Pray for those who use you. Pray for those who use you. I'm gonna have the worship team come back up as we wrap this part up and read this last scripture here. Matthew chapter five, verse 43 through 48 in the Passion Translation says this. It says, your ancestors have also been taught, love your neighbors and hate the one who hates you. However, I say to you, love your enemy. Bless the one who curses you. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you. How hard is this, right? It's like, how hard is it to do this stuff? It's very simple, but it's challenging to do. It says, bless the one who curses you. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you and respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. 
For that will reveal, watch this, okay, this is key. This will reveal your identity as children of your heavenly father. What's it saying? This is the way God acts. By doing these things, the, the people who do these things reveal who they are, that they are children of God. So that when people who do this kind of stuff, their identity is showing. Their identity in Christ is showing. It's revealing who they are in Christ. And it says, he is kind to all by bringing the sunrise to warm and rainfall uh, to refresh, whether a person who does what is good or whether they do what is evil. What reward do you deserve if you only love the lovable? Do even the tax, don't even the tax collectors do that. How are you any different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends? Don't even the ungodly do that. He's saying, it's easy for you to love people who love you back. It's easy for you to respond well to people who treat you well. Like you don't have to have Jesus to do that. You don't need the Holy Spirit in your life to do that. But how many of you guys know you need Jesus? You need the Holy Spirit to love those people, to pray for people who have used you, who have done wrong, who have stabbed you in the back, who have, and, and again, I'm not saying they have to be brought close. I'm, I'm saying to release them to God, to let God be your defender, to live surprised and not paranoid, to lift up the burden off your life, to, to bless them through your prayers, to pray for them, not like you would, you know, oh God, I, you know how bad they are. I mean, I hope you got a spot, but you know, I don't know. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about praying for them as if they were your own kids. You need a supernatural love to do that. There's no way around it. You need a supernatural love to do that. But the good news is we have a supernatural God who gives us the supernatural love. And when we do that, it says in verse 48, since you are children of a perfect Father in heaven, become perfect like him. That word perfect, it, it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it does. It means mature, okay? So in other words, Jesus, here's what it's saying. Jesus knows that we can grow up. The question is, will we? See, some of us, we have been going, have you ever been frustrated where you seem to find the same, like I'm in the same situation again. These people are treating me the same way again. Have you ever been there before? Like I'm at the same conversation with these people. Maybe it's the same situation, different people. Show of hands, how many of you guys have been there before, been frustrated? I'm at the same spot again. Why am I at the same spot again? Here, here's, here's what this scripture's saying. You can grow. And if you grow, the next time you get in that situation, it's not the same situation because you are a different person. You're not in the same situation if you grow because you enter that situation a different person. You enter that situation with different love, with different levels, with less limits. That's what he's calling us to. I cannot tell you how many times somebody's walked out of my life in one way, shape, or form. I can't tell you how many texts how many handwritten notes, how many messages I send pursuing people who had an issue or walked away. And you kind of get that as a pastor because you encounter a lot more people than maybe what is normal. But I constantly pursue people. Why do I do that? Because I want to love people, but I also just want to keep my heart right towards people. Many times it's a one-way conversation. I never get a response back. But I'm gonna keep loving. I'm gonna keep pursuing. Because that reveals my identity. That I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. So what we're gonna do here at the very end is we are actually gonna put this into practice for those of you guys who are ready and brave enough to do it. We're gonna take a moment. We're gonna pray for those people that we think might be using us right now. Or maybe that there's unforgiveness in our heart. It's going, to be the, it's going to be one of the hardest things you do. It's going to be the hardest thing you do. So would you stand up with me? And uh, let's, let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. Can we give the Holy Spirit just a moment to work on us? Because some of us don't want to do this. We just don't want to do it. And it's understandable. There's a lot of reasons why we wouldn't want to do this. But can we ask right now if the Holy Spirit would just give us strength? Give us strength right now. 
And if the Holy Spirit has brought a face or a name or maybe many, a group of people to your mind, could we just begin to pray for them right now? And you may not have much to say. You may just, God, I, I want to do this. I don't, my heart's not in it, but I, I want to want this. That's a start. That's a start. Some of you guys can step out and even begin to, to pray blessings over them. You've, you've maybe spoken curses over them, but maybe you could bless them. God, I, I, want to, I want them to have an encounter with you like I would want to have for myself. God, I pray that you get a hold of their heart so that, that the love that you have flows through them, that they feel your love in spite of what they've done, that they feel the love and the grace that comes from you that I hope to have for myself, that I hope to have for my kids. You can begin to bless them right now. As painful and as hard as it is, this is where healing comes. This is where your heart gets set free. Set free. So God, we pray for those right now who maybe have spoken against us, who maybe wronged us, used us, manipulated, only told half the story for their benefit. Lord, we ask right now that you would just pour out your love and pour out your grace. Lord, that you would encounter them, that they would feel loved by you. Not even so that we could benefit from it, but God, just because you love people and we love people. Lord, we pray for them right now. We pray for their good. We pray that you'd protect their heart, that you'd guard their heart. Lord, we release them, we forgive by faith. Even when we don't feel it, we just say it in our heart. We say we forgive. We forgive. We release. And Lord, I just speak healing over every one of us right now. That we could respond to what your nudge is right now from the Holy Spirit. We could respond to that by faith and begin to walk in your love and your forgiveness. That we could grow up into all things so that when we encounter these situations time and time again, we become a, a different person each time we walk into this situation so that we can be enlarged by your love and have a higher capacity to give. And we just declare that right now in Jesus' name. One of the ways we can respond is just by worshiping God. Because whenever you give worship to God and you're so thankful for the love he has for you, all of a sudden you get filled up so that you can have love for other people. So let's worship God one more time.